that's it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizing committee and especially Jerome for inviting me to present my research on uh, the, precursor the precursor on the time forecast of uh, slope avalanches. And this work was uh, done in collaboration in ETH with uh, Professor Martin Funk, Didier Sornet, and uh, Professor uh, Danny Orr, and also in uh, University of Zurich uh, with Professor Andreas Fierli. Uh, so first, um, uh, what is uh, slope instability? So it's slope instability is co can be called uh, rock slide, uh, glacier break off, landslide, a snow avalanche. Uh, it's always a failure which occurs in an in heterogeneous material and which is driven by gravity. Um, of course, you can have some additional stresses or uh, driving stress like uh, earthquake or uh, rainfall or s melt of permafrost or etc. But all these uh, can be all these slope instabilities uh, have all uh, the same characteristics, and it's a worldwide problem because, uh, for example, uh, World uh, World Bank estimates that overall uh, an overall loss of about 50 million billion U.S. dollars each year, and uh, two million people are uh, exposed to such type of hazards. And the majority of these um, people of fatalities uh, occurred in middle, low middle uh, income countries. And uh, these um, events are so powerful that sometimes it's not possible to mitigate the risk and to perform any mitigation measure. And uh, this is why early warning is often is, uh, needed to be able to evacuate people on time before the catastrophic event occur. And of course, we have some problems because uh, we are dealing with natural material, meaning that it's heterogeneous. And this heterogeneity is difficult or even impossible to quantify in uh, and measure in space, but also in time, because it's always evolving with the history of, of the stresses and so on. And rupture is a nonlinear process involving this heterogeneity. So my point here is that heterogeneity can be a chance for us because as you know, the weakest part of a material will break first. So then you can expect to have uh, a change in behavior, in, in properties before the rupture. So in this way, in, in, in this view, precursor can be, are expected. So is it possible, so the, the $5 billion uh, question is, is it possible to make a time forecast? So. Let me now consider um, a simple material, ice. And ice, so glacier, is composed of a unique material uh, which is only on a, on, a, on a bedrock. So this type of system is an excellent model system for us for studying such instabilities. And so the question is what can we learn from uh, glacier instabilities and is there any possibility to apply this to other slope instabilities? So uh, I suppose you have all seen some glaciers and um, normally it's um, ice, so snow that accumulates and then starts to flow under its own weight, so driven by gravity. Normally it's gentle a gentle flow, but sometimes it can break. And we classify, uh, we can distinguish three different types of, of uh, glacier instabilities, depending according to uh, the thermal properties at the bed ice bedrock interface. And if uh, the, this ice bedrock is temperate, then uh, you have the presence of liquid water in, in this interface and it starts to become a mess for us to really understand uh, the processes at stake there. And we tried to, uh, we perform, we made some uh, slider block models, including um, a competition between frictional sliding and tension cracking. And 
anyway, it's a bit complicated, but still with such type of model, you can explain the processes there, uh, which leads to the instability. But still, it is quite difficult to predict. Also, we found some critical condition, necessary condition for the rupture to occur. Uh, it's not always the case, and it's always a bit tricky. Uh, here in this talk, I will focus more on the cold glacier case where the ice is frozen onto its bedrock, and there it's you have no no liquid water, and then it's a quasi-static driving uh, stress. And there, in this case, I will show you some some results on the predictability of this. So first, uh, let's come back to what is a cold glacier. So um, a cold glacier is a glacier that uh, is located at a very high altitude, or uh, is uh, above the equilibrium line altitude, meaning that it cannot I it's not melting. So the only way for the glacier to evolve is to grow, grow, become fat, and then when it's too fat, <laughs> it breaks. <laughs> so uh, it's always, it's cyclic. It's a cyclic behavior, and and so uh, we had uh, uh, quite a lot of experiment on the Weissong Glacier, which is on the Matatal Valley near Zermatt, and there, here you had a, a glacier. You had a glacier which uh, repeatedly broke off, and um, you see that here we are at ab uh, above 4,000 meters, and if a nice avalanche or triggered, it can reach the valley here, 3,000 meters uh, in the valley here, and uh, destroying this small village um, so two, three times. So it is quite important to, uh, to, uh, assume to, to look at such type of glaciers. And, but the problem is that we have to move the lab to the mountains. So uh, <laughs> I know for you it's <laughs> a bit strange, but for us, we are obliged to do. So uh, the first idea was to look at the geometry, the change in the geometry. You have to do simple in this case. So what can we do? So we can measure the surface displacement using some theodolite measurements, photogrammetry, extensometer, extensometer and so on. And you can try to track the evolution of the surface displacement. And what, you what uh, first Flotron showed is that it could fit uh, an empirical uh, power law, uh, which is quite convenient for us because um, if you have uh, lots of data, then you can compute this TC, which is the critical time at which the velocity is supposed to be infinite. Of course, in reality, it will break first. So. Uh, but still, w with such kind of law, you can observe and you can make some prediction about when it will break. And so this was in 73, and uh, in, in 2005, again, the glacier was exactly at the same, uh, at exactly the same geometry. And uh, this time, we uh, also put some uh, stakes on it, and we can measure very accurately the displacement. And there we recover this power law acceleration, but we had uh, some strange oscillation uh, before the rupture. So it is just like it, sh it is a bit like this, uh, this cartoon. So it was a bit strange, and we didn't know exactly why. And in 2014, in the Grand Jura Glacier, which is you just have to, to cross the uh, Mont Blanc Tunnel. And there was also another glacier which was uh, supposed to be infine, uh, unstable. And we put also some stakes on it. And again, we recovered this power law acceleration. But superimposed on this, we also had this log periodic oscillation, which is called log periodic oscillations. And this time, but with uh, more than 30 centimeters. So you have like an acceleration and superimposed on this, some jerky motion. So uh, using this, this, um, this different laws, you are able to compute the critical time, but of course, in reality, it will break before the, the infinite uh, 
velocity is, is, uh, is reached. But uh, assuming uh, a typical velocity from 15, 50 centimeters per day up to one, you can really have some uh, prediction, perfect prediction, uh, 15 days before the rupture. So uh, 15 days before the rupture, if you acquired enough data, of course, you can predict exactly when uh, the glacier will break up. So this was already mm, some kind of uh, good uh, results. But why do we have this power acceleration, log periodic oscillation, and so on? So if you come back to the to complex system, you see that you have a lots of entity with simple behavior, interaction, heterogeneity. You have a lot of example, uh, I won't uh, explain this to you, but market, internet, and so on. And they have some common properties like scale invariance in time and in space, hierarchization, uh, hierarchic structure, and an emerging behavior. And if we consider the rupture as a complex phenomena, I don't under in the non-equilibrium -equi critical phenomena and so on, but just a complex phenomena, you see that in this case, rupture, you have some, some micro cracks, you have this interaction, which are the stress concentration at the tip of the uh, crack tip. Ice structure is, of course, heterogeneous. And you have uh, some power law. So these are these scale invariants. But um, if you have, during this process, an um, the appearance of, of, um, the uh, the appearance of a, a scale, this is called the discrete scale invariance then your power law, the exponent, is complex. And then in the real part, you obtain this log periodic oscillation. So this could be a framework for us to observe these log periodic uh, oscillations. So, so far, the, the cartoon is like this. You have your micro cracks that starts to develop within the glacier. And then uh, reaching a critical damage, this this, this small uh, uh, micro cracks starts to see each other. And of course, when you start to see each other, you start to argue, to cry, and to merge, and to, to uh, add some, jer so some jerky motion, and so on. So this can starts to produce your log periodic oscillations. And then you enter in this catastrophic regime, and then everything breaks. So the second thing to that can be observed is maybe can we try to detect and quantify these micro cracks? So the second idea, of course, is to trying to make some se seismic survey on these glaciers because it's quite <coughs> convenient for us because now you don't observe, but you start to hear. So you, you, are not, you are shifting from the external observation to an internal observation. And of course, it's independent of the visibility condition because in mountains you have always uh, bad weather and so on, and which perturbs a lot the observations. And also, it's a continuous measurement. Right. So um, we had one geophones on the Weisshorn glaciers, and we could record uh, th more than 1,700 ice quakes uh, three days before the, the, the break off. And the first um, thing that we have done is, of course, just like looking at the seismicity. And uh, so you can look it at uh, the number of events per hour or the inverse of the waiting time, which is more or less the same. And first, what you see is that you have some more or less a stable uh, seismic activity, then a decrease, and then a uh, uh, sudden acceleration. So already a sudden acceleration is already good for us. So we have some something to to see but uh, and now so this was independent of the um, energy and now we've we also performed some statistical analysis of the energy and so uh, what we've done is that we've taken some uh, some sliding windows far away from rupture and getting always a bit closer and uh, first what you can see is that you have a uh, really nice power law, uh, far uh, way before the, the rupture, which with an exponent uh, 0.6, which is exactly the Gutenberg-Richter law, meaning that in this case, ice is just like a piece of earth or something like this. And then 
you have uh, some transition, so no more power law, and few days before the rupture, uh, the, the, the final rupture, you have, you recover this power law, but with a, a very different exponent and with some characteristic events, which could be related to the size of the, of the glacier. So this was uh, interesting, and when you start to look at, oh, you will have to take your, your glasses here, um, the waiting time statistics, there it's also quite interesting because it's not like a B model or whatever uh, statistics, it's just like first you have far away, so way before the, the rupture, you have a power law distribution of this waiting time, but just when you are getting closer to the, 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 the rupture, then it's shifting to an exponential. So it was a bit strange. And not also that when you look at the seismic activity, which is also here, and the oscillating part, it's here, it seems to be quite well correlated, meaning that the seismic activity is not correlated with the, um, the acceleration itself, but with this jerky motion. So uh, let me summarize a bit and trying to understand a bit more the processes at stake there. So at first, what can be seen is that you ha your glacier is um, uh, has time to adapt to its change. So is in a self-organized critical state and as soon uh, he knows that he's too big, too fat, but he adapts. So you have uh, power low and stable uh, seismic activity, um, cumulative uh, seismic frequency distribution is power low and so on. And then um, something happened, the critical um, damage, uh, density of damage is reached and then you start to really have interaction and uh, hierarchization of the fracture process, leading to uh, a transition and you know the glacier don't know where he is, he's doing whatever, and then the damage starts to cluster and the, the cluster are randomly activated, leading to this exponential uh, waiting time distribu uh, exponential distribution of the waiting time and so on. So now I think we have a, a clear picture of what's going on before the, 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 the glacier uh, break up. So this seismic monitoring seems to be a promising methods but to be applied effectively we have a lot of practical problem of course. Uh, of course here in this case it was only one sensor so if what can you say w just with one sensor? Also, you have a lot of process to of data to process, and uh, you have a problem in transferring this data and uh, some problem of power supplies, of course. And you have more the theoretical problem. What is the effect of attenuation, uh, of the attenuation of the seismic wave within the, the glacier? So to, to tackle this problem, um, to un trying to understand a bit more the effect of attenuation. Um, of course, when you have a crack, your, your it releases some elastic stress. And from a sensor's perspective, the slope is a low-pass filter, so you won't really hear far away the, uh, the, um, the, the high uh, frequency uh, range. And of course, if you have a very small event which is close to the sensor, you will hear something big. And if it's a big uh, event which is far away, we'll just hear nothing. So you have an ambiguity in this, uh, in the interpretation of the size frequency distribution uh, of the magnitude and amplitude. So to tackle this problem, I just use a very simple model, the simplest one you can imagine. This is a fiber model model. Um, so I, I think everyone knows it. And what is uh, quite um, interesting is that, again, you are all your fibers, you stretch all your fibers which, are r uh, with random, which have random strength. And as soon as one fiber reach his strength, then he redistribute his rake and he redistribute his load. 
um, either on all the surviving uh, fibers or you can choose some different rules on the four neighbors and so on. So it, but it changes completely the behavior of your bundle. But what is interesting is that you start with elastic brittle uh, fibers and with this interaction and so on, you end up in mechanics, we call it an elastoplastic behavior. So with plastic, you make elastic. So it's quite interesting. And so let's, m let's move to the results. Um, so we realized, so we made a lot of tests. So each time, so you, you try to compute, uh, you have a direct link between the avalanche size and the um, seismic or the acoustic emission. And uh, we perform exactly the same analysis as for the Vison. So we put the sliding windows far away from rupture and then we go uh, uh, always a bit closer. And you see that when approaching the failure for the ductal-like, so with democratic um, redistribution, uh, first you have only small uh, avalanches and then when you go toward the rupture, you have large avalanches. And it's every, uh, always distributed in a Paolo uh, manner. And also for, also you have a far less uh, event. For brittle-like rupture, it's exactly the same. But now when accounting for attenuation, so you imagine it's, it's numeric, so it's very simple for us. Um, you put a virtual center on the, um, in your bundle and then you try to compute the attenuated amplitude that you reach. So you sum up all the, the, the fiber that breaks and which uh, the amplitude is inversely proportional to the distance, just that. And then you see that you start to, you don't see anything or it's quite difficult to, to distinguish between if you are closer to rupture, so the red line, to or if you are far away. So the idea there was to see, yeah, well, why not, why not using a lot of sensors? And of course, of virtual sensors. And of course, if um, you, you say how much of the sensors can detect, so how much of the sensor can detect an event, so which, if it is uh, very close to the sensor, it will detect, but the other won't. So how much of the, the sensor will detect the same event uh, above a certain threshold. And what you could see is that if your sensor, virtual sensor is, is very sensitive, of course, everyone will hear your, your event, but if it starts to be not sensitive, then it starts to be interesting because for example, if you look at this uh, green uh, arrow, if you say, yeah, I want that seven uh, sensors detect an event at the same time, this, this already gives you, uh, you are already sure that you are in this catastrophic regime, so very close to rupture. So this is very simple, but still, if you, you, you could see, you should see, uh, just by knowing how much sensor detect, very insensitive, how much they detect, then you can have a chance to say, to have a, a prognose or uh, on of when it's, it's uh, going on. Uh, so we try to test this um, in lab. So we really exploit some data from a snow uh, experiment. So this was a snow pack which were uh, lying on, 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 um, on the base and then they uh, increase the angle and up to the failure and they had some acoustic emission measurements. And when you make this, uh, you plot the acoustic emission count, you see that almost nothing appears and then it breaks suddenly. But with this simple idea of co-detection, you see that way before you see, s first it's just one detect, then two detect, three, four, five, and at six, uh, everything's break. So it seems to work at least in laboratory. So we asked, well, wh why not you try to use this uh, on a real case? But you know, in nature, y y you have to find a way, uh, a place, a location where you ha will have some sli uh, slope instability and it's not so, <laughs> so easy. And we find the perfect candidate in a rock glacier. So rock glacier is uh, a mixture of rock uh, ice, water, air, and so on. 
that move very slowly e down the valley. And this one was quite interesting because he had a steep uh, tongue. And there we were almost sure that something would happen. And so we put six geophones um, on just near the, the this, uh, this tongue and uh, for one month. And what we could see is that first it seems to work. So we, we detected two uh, landslides, which were quite small. It was only 20 uh, cubic meters. But you see here is the number of co-detection. We also had uh, only six sensors. But you see that uh, for different, so it was an a posteriori uh, analysis, and we could tune this sensitivity. And red is very insensitive, and this uh, green dot is very sensitive. So you see that first nothing, then starts to tuk 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 tuk, and then you see that for the most sensitive, you have a peak here, but for the red line, you see this acceleration, and you see really that you have something which is happening just before the rupture. And uh, cherry on the cake, you can <coughs> see that um, uh, you can compare this to other um, noise, and you see that uh, which were correlated with uh, rain. So as soon as you have rain, this system just move and so on. And you have a lot of seismic activity, but you have almost no detection. So with this kind of system, you uh, might be able to detect a bit before uh, and to distinguish between this exogenous and endogenous failure. And just to summarize, so we use this avalanching glacier for uh, instability for a model uh, to understand the slope instability and we found some precursory sign and early warning seems to be possible using this uh, surface displacement and this seismic uh, strategy uh, measurements and we found some new strategy that takes advantage of both this heterogeneity and this attenuation which was first our problems and this reverse a bit the 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 monitoring system because usually you have one uh, very good sensor and then you try to do it, uh, do your assessment. There it's reverse, so you have a lot of sensor, very insensitive, and less data to process, so you can do this in real time. And it should work for uh, more or less all kind of slope instability. And just to finish, uh, we I'd like to, to build up to make some more experiments on this using this such type of alternative uh, monitoring system using just uh, this sensor. Uh, so this would be a, a complementary system which would just no, not more look at the uh, instability but also hear the instability. With that, I would like to thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, not <laughs> First, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is also flowing. Uh, it, it's not flowing because it, it's frozen at this bedrock. So it's just like more creeping, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, that's an open question. I, um, I have no clue. Um, at least this fiber model, model is very simple, but still you can you can recover some some catch some feature on what's going on before, and there I, it might be um, an intermediate case. And uh, as you could, so nature of course is far more complex as what we can model in every. Uh, so what is possible. Um, but uh, here I think really that the, 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 the glacier enters in a phase, so this uh, catastrophic phase and this transitional behavior, which is really linked to, uh, um, to the, the, um, the, 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 the small uh, fracture pattern that starts to merge and, 
and then it starts to be really complicated in this case. But more I cannot say, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Just referring to the point of uh, yeah. between the, the solver yeah. and what you are for and uh, the attenuator. This could also be linked to the attenuation. The of, of, uh, the data in the two sets is very different from the one. So there is a very short memory. And there is it, a it uh, you mean uh, uh, this, this, this? The, the other one, the, the right, the problem is this one. This one. The, the data gives you the, the exponential uh, decay. Yeah. That probably has much less uh, data points, the, da the, the dense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and you also wanted to give a, a new shape uh, 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 mixture, but it, I think that to get the solar data one, you need to have a, a window, a long class, to mix probably all the fluctuation in the yeah, but at least you, you, you to say that it's a parallel, you need at least two order of magnitude. Yeah. And so we had this, two order of magnitude. Yeah, but I, I took all the, even before <coughs> this um, 5.3 days. So I think here I mix quite a lot in, in this sense because uh, of course, we have only 1,700 ice quake. So we do what we can what with what we have. That's always a problem in, in natural science. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that, that's all the, the, the problem. And also, I didn't mention it, but um, uh, we perform some, we, we have made some um, experimental uh, experiment in Matterhorn Glacier, uh, in Matterhorn, which was at 3,500 meters, and trying to, to look at the, w the, the seismic wave and also the acoustic waves and so on. So from the broad uh, frequency range. And what you could see, in fact, is that if you starts to hear a too high um, uh, frequency, the y you have so much attenuation that you can't hear more than 20 centimeters. So in this way, you need to be between 10 and 50 hertz. And more I cannot say, but I, I it's really depending also on the material. For example, glacier attenuates a lot, uh, rocks less, and of course, it's always a trade-off and knowing which one is what is more like an exper uh, so an experience <laughs> so so to say You mean this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't remember. No, I have to look at uh, in my paper. Yeah. Sorry. It's not so, yeah. 